Bob Jolly. I'm the director here at the Athenaeum. Um, I'm just going to talk for a minute. I'm going to get out of the way. Um, thanks for coming to this forum for attorney general candidates. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to turn the podium over to Sonia Schuyler, who is going to introduce the program and, and um, get us going. Just a couple of things quick. Thanks to KATV for simulcasting this, because this is bringing it to all of the people who are home, and that's a great opportunity. If, you, if, you, if you're not here live, if you're not watching at home, you're not making an effort, and that's your problem. Don't talk about the ladies. The bathrooms are in the basement. For those of you who don't know this building, take the elevator right there, basement level. There aren't stairs. Uh, two to come back up here. There are masks there. This is not political. If you want a mask, there's a pile of masks right back there. Um, this is an excellent time to turn off your cell phone. And I use mine for a clock, but watch me go. Mm. Something, 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 something. I'll figure this out. Um, that's all I have to say. Please welcome Sonia Schuyler, who is a board member of the League of Women Voters of Vermont. Here is Sonia. Hello, and welcome from the League of Women Voters to this uh, 2022 Attorney General Candidates Forum. Uh, we have, oh, we have, not set for short people. <laughs> uh, we have co-sponsors, the Athenaeum. Thanks very much for the gracious co-sponsoring and hosting of the events. Also, the Vermont Commission on Women, the ACLU of Vermont, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Burlington Chapter. Um, I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the League of Women Voters and head of the Elections Committee. The League is strictly nonpartisan. We never endorse candidates, uh, and we never oppose candidates. The pur our purpose in hosting the candidate forum is for you, the voter, to meet your candidates to hear what they have to say on the issues and to ask questions. Uh, we have two candidates running for Secretary of State, excuse me, Attorney General. <laughs> wrong, wrong forum. This is the last one. <laughs> Sorry. Little present. Uh, the Attorney General is the chief law enforcement officer in the state, providing legal counsel in all matters in which the state is a party or has an interest. The Attorney General's office enforces criminal, environmental, consumer protection, civil rights, and other laws to keep cities, towns, and homes safe. Uh, now I'd like to call on Carrie Brown, who is Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women, who will be the moderator for this forum, and she's also uh, on Montpelier City Council. So welcome, Carrie. Good evening, everyone. Oh, oh, here, Justice. Can you hear me all right? All right, great. It's great to see you. I was um, in another one of these forums last week, and I was in the audience. And so it's really great to have this view of this amazing room. This building is unbelievable. Um, thank you so much to the Athenaeum for hosting, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and the Women's in International League for Peace and Freedom in the Burlington chapter. And thank you to the candidates who are here. I'm looking forward to this discussion. All right, so the way things are going to go, uh, actually first I'll introduce the candidates to you. Um, so first we have Charity Clark from Williston, and we have Michael Taglavia from Corinth. And I will let them tell you more about themselves. I won't take any time talking about them. So our, form for, our format for tonight is they will, each candidate will have two minutes to give an opening statement, and then we will have questions that we will ask, and they'll each get a chance to answer, and they'll each have two minutes. We have a timer up front who's keeping track of the time, so you all can look here and see your warning signs for when you're running out of time, when it's time to stop. And then we will have questions from the audience. We've also got some questions that have been sent to us ahead of time from the public and then the candidates will have an opportunity for closing statements. All right, are you ready? Okay, so we, we drew lots before this started to see who would go first, and Ms. Clark is our first one up, so go ahead. 
Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Carrie, and everyone for being here tonight. Thank you to the sponsors and the FNAM. It's, it's really wonderful to be here. My story begins in southern Vermont, where I grew up working in my family's grocery store. I uh, stocked shelves, I ran the cash register, and I saw all kinds of people come through my line at the checkout. I saw people thriving, people on their way to work, and I saw people struggling. And I took those experiences with me when I grew up, and I became a lawyer, but especially these last eight years working at the Attorney General's office. I was a member of the leadership team as chief of staff, and I was a part of decision making on all the major issues that came to the Attorney General's office, whether it be in the environmental division, consumer, criminal. And in my leadership, I always kept in mind that everyday Vermonter. I have been licensed to practice law in Vermont since 2005. I do believe it is important for our Attorney General to be an attorney. I have the background and the experience that this Attorney General needs. We need an Attorney General who has the scope and breadth of the office in mind, who has the legal expertise and the leadership experience to meet this moment in history, and who knows how to leverage the office for the best results for Vermont and for Vermonters. I am an attorney, I'm a Vermonter, I'm a mother, I will be ready to lead on day one. Thank you, Mr. Tavia. First, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and the Athenaeum and the other co-sponsors for having me. Um, thanks to Charity for being here. Um, my name is Michael Taglavia, and I want to be your next Attorney General. At a very young age, I was taught right from wrong. As a child, good ethics, morals, integrity, and accountability were all instilled in me. I carry those values with me today. I like to do what I can to try to help preserve Vermont's tranquility, beauty, and small town living. Along my journey, I was fortunate enough to own two successful businesses. I understand firsthand humble beginnings and the hardworking middle class. I know what it takes to focus a team toward a common goal and succeed. I'm proud to say that I'm not a career politician, just a man trying to do good things for Vermonters. I'm not an attorney. I believe that gives me an advantage. I can bring a new perspective to the table. My journey here uh, into politics began with my introduction to Samantha Lefebvre, who's my legislator in Montpelier. She expressed a need for help. I agreed to help her in any way I could. I began attending county Republican meetings and then state Republican meetings. And it culminated in an October, excuse me, August 21st afternoon meeting where I was drafted, nominated, and accepted the nomination to be the Attorney General candidate for the Republican Party. And here we are today. Again, my name is Mike Taglavia, and I'd like to be your next Attorney General. Thank you very much. We're going to alternate the order now. So this next question goes first to you, Mr. Tavidia. So this comes from the League of Women Voters. As Attorney General, what are your legislative priorities? My legislative priorities are <clears throat> public safety, public safety, public safety. Um, people no longer feel as safe as they once did. Um, I want to try to change that. And one of the main reason, things I want to try to do is take the 100 plus million dollar big pharma lawsuit settlements that are coming because of the opioid crisis and apply them to law enforcement and drug abatement programs. Drug interdiction efforts also would be part of the um, effort. Stopping drug traffickers and keeping the drugs off the street would be a great way to start. Um, we need to also stop the revolving door of our bail system. We need to have it made very clear to would-be criminals that they will be held accountable for their actions. I oppose any reduction to qualified immunity, and I will heavily lobby leg the legislature against removing or modifying qualified immunity. Our police need qualified immunity. They also need to be fully funded, well-trained, and well-equipped. 
to do their job and do it safely. Also, I would look, push for more education through the LEAD program, Law Enforcement Against Drugs, in our schools. It's a low-cost, high-impact program that will help keep our kids away from addictive drugs. Um, working to prevent child pornography and sex trafficking is also going to be one of my main pushes. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Clark. Um, one of the important roles that the Attorney General plays is supporting the legislature in their work. It is something I'm very familiar with because as Chief of Staff for four years, I supervised the efforts of the Attorney General to support the legislature. I was in the State House a lot and um, you know, just supporting the, the work that, that we do there. I do have priorities in mind for January. The first would be to ensure that Vermont is a safe harbor for those who are seeking an abortion and for providers here in Vermont who provide abortions. I also believe strongly that we need to be living our values when it comes to uh, global warming, make sure we're protecting our environment. That means ensuring that we are meeting the targets set forth in the Global Warming Solutions Act in terms of greenhouse gas uh, and emissions. And the, le the legislature has work to do in that regard. I wanna be the attorney general who can support them doing that work and making sure that uh, policies and laws are passed to make sure we meet those targets. We also need to expand the sealing and expungement law, which allows people with old criminal records to put the past behind them and have those records sealed so they can get better jobs. We also, um, in my view, need to uh, look at data privacy. Um, this is an issue that I have worked very closely on for the past four years. I co-authored a uh, detailed memo in January that outlined a comprehensive data privacy bill that would, again, have us living our values here in Vermont of respecting privacy, but especially for children. Finally, um, we have in Vermont 40,000 victims of domestic and sexual violence every year, 40,000. I don't think we do enough in that area. The Attorney General's office um, has housed within it a commission of stakeholders that is uh, uh, directed by the legislature. And every year they look at the fatalities related to domestic violence. They um, produce recommendations related to their review. And I will zealously advocate for implementation of their recommendations. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right, our next question will start with you. Uh, all right, so please summarize and prioritize the duties of the Attorney General. Well, the Attorney General, in, in shorthand, is the lawyer to the state, and they have 150 people working there. 90 of them are attorneys. There's seven divisions, um, and it's a wide variety of divisions. There's um, the General Counsel and Administrative Law Division that um, provides bas basic attorney, attorney uh, services to client agencies like the Department of Taxes and that kind of thing. There's the Environmental Division, the Civil Division, which def uh, represents the lawsuits when we're sued, um, the Human Services Division, the Public Protection Division, the Criminal Division, and the Appellate Division that handles the appeals to the Supreme Court. Um, we bring lawsuits when a crime is, um, is committed. We bring um, lawsuits in civil court when violations of environmental or uh, consumer law have been, um, have been violated. And um, we support the legislature, as I mentioned earlier, and just provide some of that day-to-day -day, um, you know, advice that is needed. Um, reviewing contracts is not really exciting, um, but that's part of what we do. Thank you. Mr. Taglavia. The Attorney General is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for the state. Um, as I said before, I'm not an attorney, but as your Attorney General, I will be the administrator and the team leader and helping decide where the priorities will be as far as what cases will be brought and um, how many people should be assigned to certain divisions. Um, Cherry has me at a little bit of an advantage because she's been there before, um, but I can tell you that I am a quick study and that with the right team, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who are on the team there who will be very helpful, um, I will be able to keep the state 
on an even keel and help right some of the problems that are in a big issue, like I said, with law enforcement issues in the state today. Um, the criminal division will be one of the divisions that I want to make sure is, is uh, made stronger, uh, bolstered, and maybe even larger. And I would do that first by making the other divisions more efficient, find out where we can be made more efficient, and moving people to the criminal division where necessary uh, before trying to go and increase the budget. But the criminal division, for me, would be the primary division to be looking at. All right, thank, thank you. you. Our next question comes from the ACLU, another one of the sponsors from tonight. And we'll start with you, Mr. Tagovia. Qualified immunity is a court-made doctrine that prevents liability for government officials and employees when they violate someone's constitutional rights, unless it was clear, usually based on a prior court case, that those rights were well established. This means a court can agree, yes, harm, no foul. Is it fair that individuals who are physically and emotionally harmed by the violation of their rights at the hands of police, for instance, receive no compensation due to qualified immunity because a similar case did not previously happen before? Whether you support or oppose maintaining quality, qualified immunity, how would you address this imbalance? Um, I would want to look at individual cases. Um, the, the reason I am against even looking at the qualified immunity right now in our place in history right now is we need to be sure that we're sending a message to our law enforcement in this state, whether they be sheriffs, town police, or Vermont State Police, that we have their back, that they will get funding and they will get the training that they need. Um, all police officers and law enforcement in this state are subject to a code of ethics, the criminal law, as well as civil law. So um, I would want to be able to look at the specifics of a case before I made an, uh, an assessment. But there, there would still be ways, or still are ways, to hold an officer, a law enforcement officer, accountable if he was to be um, found in a violation. I, I think the message to the community needs to be that we want our law enforcement to stick around, we want them to be well trained, and that we have our, their back. I know that law enforcement are just flesh and blood men and women just like the rest of us in this room and i'm not saying they won't make mistakes and where egregious mistakes are made they need to be held accountable but i will not make uh, a judgment against someone without seeing all the facts of the case first all right thank, thank you, you. all of us deserve to be safe and to feel <clears throat> safe I believe, you know, we are at a, a reckoning point in this country when it comes to policing. I think that's a good thing to see what can we be doing better. We um, are very fortunate to have um, folks who are willing to go into policing. I agree there is a massive shortage right now, as in many industries. It's, it's a problem. We need to be thinking about um, recruiting and retention. But when it comes to qualified immunity, I, I really do believe in police accountability and um, that there should be regress for someone who is harmed. The legislature has currently instructed their legislative council, who's their lawyer in, uh, at the State House, to do legal research and write a memo that looks at qualified immunity around the country so that the legislature can determine what qualified Im immunity should look like here in Vermont. I am looking forward to being a part of that conversation as your attorney general. I think it's very important. I'm looking forward to reading that memo. I understand it's not finished yet, and I, I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you. Our next question comes from the Vermont Commission on Women. And the question is, would you take any action to protect individuals who travel to Vermont to seek abortion care, or to protect Vermont-based abortion providers who care for out-of-state patients here in Vermont or through telemedicine? And Ms. Clark, you're first. No, never. 
I believe it is a human right to control your own body, to make decisions about your own health care, and to access an abortion. Do you want to talk about how you might protect them, if that's appropriate? Yes, thank you for the second part <laughs> of the question. Um, this summer, I put forth my own safe harbor plan, which if you're really curious, is on my website, to um, make Vermont a safe harbor in the wake of the Dobbs decision, which stripped from us our right to an abortion that occurred more, more years ago than, I'm, than I've been alive. Um, and I personally was outraged and devastated, as I think many Vermonters were, to, uh, to learn of, that our right had been stripped and moved quickly to put a plan in place to, not to put a, you know, put, to propose a plan that hopefully we, we put in place um, by the legislature and others to do everything that we can to make sure that we pr are preserving our rights and we're protecting people who need an abortion or who perform abortions. We also have um, you know, tools at our disposal that maybe aren't as obvious. I'm gonna give one example. Our Consumer Protection Act is very nimble and can do many things. One of the, uh, the challenges that folks who are seeking an abortion may have is misinformation on the web about um, abortion access. And I, as Attorney General, will use the Consumer Protection Act to ensure there is no deception in the marketplace and to have a no tolerance policy for um, pregnancy centers who uh, deceive anyone. Thank you. Mr. Tabavia. Could you just read me the, the question again? Certainly. Would you take any action to protect individuals who travel to Vermont to seek abortion care, or to protect Vermont-based abortion providers who care for out-of-state patients here in Vermont or through telemedicine? Uh, I wouldn't go uh, and seek to penalize someone traveling to the state um, for any reason. Um, I'm, it's, it's disappointing to me that we would try to market ourselves as a state to come to for abortion services. Um, I don't, I am pro-life, but I do not believe that someone coming to the state of Vermont needs to be punished. Um, the, uh, another thing I'd like to address is the, the Roe decision what it did was it affirmed states' rights. It affirmed federalism. It did not remove anyone's right in this state to an abortion. No one in this state, the day after that decision came down, was forbidden from getting an abortion in this state. Now, that's not to say that I support that. I'm just stating the way the law is. As the Attorney General, I would be bound by the law. I would not be the king and decide unilaterally how to apply law. Um, but I, do, I don't think that the idea of taking punitive action against someone is a good idea. But I also don't think, like I said before, it, having Vermont labeled as a state to come for abortion access, I, I don't think that's, that's a good commercial for the state. Um, you know, and we're, as Charity brought up, some things that are coming up in the legislature. Um, there will be a push to legalize prostitution, and I will lobby the legislature heavily against that. If we want to stop the drug problem in this state, a legalizing prostitution will not help us stopping the drug issue. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. To what extent, as the Attorney General, will you pursue litigation against violators of specific state laws, be it environmental, commercial, or law enforcement, et cetera? We are particularly interested in environmental violations given the EPA's new health advisories on PFAS, P-F-A-S, which I cannot tell you, I'm, I'm not gonna try to say what the whole thing is. It's a, an abbreviation for a chemical, and classification of two forms of PFAS as hazardous substances. Is that for me first? That is for you, okay. yes. Um, with respect to the PFAS, um, I don't know a lot about it. Uh, apparently those chemicals are in a lot of our everyday use products. 
Um, and my first question was, what are we doing? I think a lot of our products that we store food in no longer have those chemicals in them, but they're still prevalent. Um, I would not support completely shutting down the use of those chemicals for risk of the law of unintended consequences where we go and create another problem. But if we know of the problems with them, we, we need to be pushing toward eliminating the use of them. Um, with respect to environmental law, um, and I guess you're talking about possibly the, um, the green initiatives, um, I worry a lot about the laws and uh, the, the commission, like there's a commission, I forgot what the, na the name of the commission is, but what I believe the push is in this state is going to so adversely affect the economy of this state that the, the people on the lower financial end of the spectrum are going to be the ones hurt first and hurt the most. And the last thing we want to do is go hit another blow to the financial economy of this state by enforcing environmental laws before we have other options like eliminating fossil fuels and cars and trucks that burn fossil fuels. Thank you. I believe that we all deserve clean, safe drinking water um, and PFAS contamination we know has been a problem, especially in southern Vermont, in Bennington County, where I grew up. And um, it's unacceptable. As Attorney General, I will take that responsibility very seriously and pursue actions against chemical companies and others who are polluters. I believe very strongly that one of the values we have here in Vermont is loving our beautiful natural environment, which we all enjoy together, walking, hiking, skiing, you know, hunting. And I take that responsibility of the uh, Attorney General very seriously. Our environmental division at the AG's office works closely with the Agency of Natural Resource and brings actions um, independently as well. It's something that um, will be a priority for me um, as, a, as a personal value that I have. Thank you. All right, we have another question from the League of Women Voters. How do you see your role in creating bipartisan dialogue and policy development in this extremely partisan and volatile political climate? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in, in southern Vermont, and you always, if you live in a tiny town with no stoplight on a dirt road next to a farm, you always get along with everyone because if you didn't, you it would just be you and the squirrels and you wouldn't have any friends. So I've had a long life of getting along with everyone and I think it's really important. So, I mean, we all have experienced this, you know, at town meeting, at the local store where we might not always agree with uh, the person we see, our neighbor, but we try really hard to find the common ground and be friendly and cordial. It's um, a, a part of my ethos personally. When I work in the state house, I always Always try to be friendly with um, you know the friends across the aisle and would continue that ethos as Attorney General. Thank you. Mr. Tenbia. Um, the short answer is difficult. Um, I can recall a conversation I had with a gentleman at the Tunbridge Fair a couple weeks ago. Um, he and I were from opposite ends of the spectrum but we had a 45 minute long discussion and in the end we did find common ground. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be easy but if we have the best interest of this state in mind and we keep that in the forefront of our thoughts then it should be made a little bit easier. All right our next question comes again from the ACLU of Vermont. Police traffic stops across Vermont have shown persistent racial disparities in stops and searches of black drivers, while those drivers are less likely than white drivers to be found with contraband. We also see significant racial disparities in who is imprisoned for drug crime, among other things. How will you use the Attorney General's office to address the racial disparities in the criminal legal system? Mr. Um, 
I'd, I'd like to start off by saying, and I believe it's a biblical quote, I'm not my brother's keeper. Um, I would like to see more of the specifics about the disparities in vehicle stops. Um, but I can say, uh, use an example. <clears throat> if you stop, were to stop a vehicle at night for a specific reason, I don't know too many police officers who can actually see into the vehicle well enough to see who the occupant is. Um, in those type instances, I don't know that it could be classified as um, racially motivated stop. Like I said, I would like to see more of some of the um, specifics. Um, but I don't, I know that if you were to walk into a prison and ask if there was anybody who was guilty, they would all say they, they were interested. Um, law enforcement in the field is just one part of the criminal justice system. They present with a case, a case with the evidence and the attorney general and the attorneys who will be trying a case will have to evaluate the evidence to see if it should go to trial and if it does go to trial, what the possibilities of a conviction would be. So I think we need to still look at each individual case and not look at statistics and what the statistics supposedly show us. If I was to commit a crime, then I would be the one who needed to be held responsible. And Lady Justice is blind, so everybody, uh, including the police and the Attorney General's office, should act that way too. Thank you. Ms. Clark. I believe this is a problem that affects all of us, and all of us need to be a part of the solution because racial disparities have no place in Vermont, and we all need to care and be a part of the solution. We are really lucky here in Vermont. We had, like a few years ago, I think a grant, and this outside organization that's a nonprofit um, used data to advise the legislature and stakeholders um, in a working group kind of process for changes that could be made to our criminal justice system. And, and uh, the latter portion of that was called Justice Reinvestment, focused on racial disparities. That report came out in the spring, and some of the recommendations are already being implemented, I believe. Um, one of them was to have judges and others make sure that they were doing implicit bias training. And another was to create sentencing guidelines for judges. Um, I support that work. I was involved in that process, and internally in the Attorney General's office, one of the recommendations involved our office and you know, immediately phoned the person responsible. It was data collection by our community justice unit, and they, um, they started doing a better job of collecting data. I really love that kind of collaboration. I think it's a great way um, to make progress, is to use data to push the needle on, on uh, problems like this. So. Yeah, I would continue to take that approach and implement those uh, policies. Thank you. You all are doing so well at staying within the time limits. So it's very impressive. <laughs> all right, this next question comes from the Vermont Commission on Women. Vermont has experienced some high profile cases of women murdered by their <coughs> partners or ex-partners in the past few years, which shines a spotlight on a perennial issue here in Vermont. What measures will you take to reduce domestic violence and violence against women? Um, this is one of the marquee issues of my campaign. Um, if you go to my website, you will see this is one of the top issues of my campaign. Domestic violence, in my view, does not get enough attention from all of us. I will be the first woman elected Attorney General of Vermont. Um, as we know, domestic violence is a very gendered issue, and I will take it incredibly seriously. Before I mentioned uh, the commission that's housed within the Attorney General's office called the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission, and they give recommendations every year. And I will make sure that those recommendations are implemented. And I want to, since I have time, and I already mentioned this, this commission in the report, I'll give you a couple of examples. 
One of the examples is, and progress every year is made, but we, we got to do better. One example is that when an abuser is um, has a relief from abuse order against them, they uh, a judge has the authority to take their firearms away, but thought wasn't given previously enough to um, the idea that this person might be staying in a home where there's firearms that belong to someone else and that that is actually a danger. So that was one of the recommendations of the of the group of stakeholders in this commission. Um, and there's, a, there's more involved. Um, they're not all legislative uh, related. Um, I plan on participating meaningfully in their work. And I also plan to continue what I've been doing on the campaign trail, which is going around the state and meeting with organizations that serve domestic violence survivors, that uh, house domestic violence survivors in shelters, and advocate for, for changes and improvements to help the issue of domestic violence. I just, before I, my time's up, I want to note that half of homicides every year relate to domestic violence. So if you care about public safety, you have to focus on domestic violence because it's literally half of the homicides in Vermont. Thank you. Mr. Tagliabian. Um, <clears throat> I don't know a lot about the statistics, uh, but we've all seen or heard about how we know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who's a victim of domestic violence or, in, like Charity said, they wind up a victim of homicide because of it. The criminal justice system is probably best to use data to be able to analyze how they can isolate who could possibly be the most violent. Um, domestic issues any police officer in the field will tell you is one of the most sensitive calls they could make. They could, uh, a police officer could go to a home where there's a domestic abuse call and make a decision to arrest one or both of the parties. And if one of the parties he's decided to arrest, <clears throat> The party that makes the call could wind up attacking the police officer because they just want the person to be sent out of the home, not arrested. Um, it's a really tough issue, um, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. That's why the criminal justice system, including the judges who would put a protective order in place, don't always have the answers. Every situation is different, and I'm not saying that this should not be uh, addressed. It's just a very difficult situation. And I think some of the mental health community should be involved in some of the assessments to try to keep people safer when it comes to domestic abuse. Thank you. We'll have one more question from our sponsors and then we'll go to audience questions. You've, you've sent quite a few up here to me, so. <laughs> All right, this question comes from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Will you take steps to protect documented and undocumented immigrants in Vermont from harmful or unlawful immigration enforcement practices? If so, how? If not, why? Mr. Tagliabia. Um, I would like to know what someone describes as an unlawful practice. Um, I, I, if you're talking about abuses of illegals like low wages or something like that, um, that would be something that needs to be ad addressed. Um, but in this day and age, um, Vermont, like all of the other states, are border states. Um, and I think that one of the ways we handle the uh, abuses that may or may not have occurred is to enforce our immigration laws. I don't know that our immigration system is broken, rather the people implementing the system are broken. I believe that if we have a secure border that there will be less of the uh, crimes that you brought up in your question. 
Um, I believe the best way we handle that is to have a secure border and not having um, any illegals in the country or if we find them that we do take measures to um, deport them. Thank you, Ms. Clark. I consider myself to be a humanist. I believe in people. I believe in people who are undocumented and I think it's really important that we acknowledge that we had um, you know, a difficult four years under the Trump administration where um, a lot of the policies that were uh, uh, put forth by that administration were not, um, didn't come from values that we share here in Vermont. The Attorney General plays a really important role in the national stage, joining other states who are like-minded with taking action, with joining um, lawsuits, with filing amicus briefs, which are friend of the court briefs, and um, comment letters um, in various cases. Um, when it comes to uh, immigration issues, our Attorney General, um, while I was Chief of Staff, joined lawsuits and other um, actions that other states had to try to prevent some of the harm that occurred under the Trump administration. Should that level of harm um, or any harm to people who are undocumented in Vermont occur again, I will absolutely join forces with other like-minded states and attorneys general to make sure that our values are being reflected and our voice is being heard. Thank you. All right, we will start with a um, uh, question that came in by email ahead of time. Will you support a comprehensive revision to the 1987 State of Vermont policy on solid waste disposal and related treatment of landfill leachate? I think that, what year did you say that was? 1987. There's no given, context given here, so this sounds like a quiz question. It's not meant to be a quiz. <laughs> if you don't know about what that law is, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, if, it's, if it has to do with well, leachate, which means some sort of pollution from a landfill, um, since we have better scientific practices now than we did back then, it would probably be a good idea to revisit the statute. Um, we have better ways of measuring uh, pollutants, whether it be in groundwater, um, air pollution, and such. Um, it's, it's always a good idea to um, revisit laws for a lot of reasons. Uh, in the tech age, in the internet age, we have other laws that don't even take into consideration the, uh, the internet and stuff like that. So it would be a good idea to revisit a law that would be that old. Uh, if, if we're looking to prevent pollution from landfills and stuff like that, if we have the technology, we should do it. Thank you. Um, you know, for me, I don't feel like I know uh, with specificity and context enough about that to really answer it. Um, I want to express a value that I have, which I shared earlier, of wanting to protect Vermont's environment. Um, but there's a lot of considerations that go into an issue like that, and I just I'm reluctant, without researching it, to uh, you know state an opinion. Thank you. All right, this next question uh, is a two-part question, so it's really like two questions in one. Okay, so. Sharpen your brains. <laughs> if the legislature considered decriminalization of drug possession, what would be your position? And then also, what is your view on safe injection sites? And this person writes, assume in both cases that these changes would include increased treatment. So decriminalization of drug possession and safe injection sites. And this is me. Yes. Um, I so here's the thing with, with decriminalization. I don't view it as just decriminalization. I think we should call it treatment and decriminalization whenever, we, whenever it's mentioned, because I, I think that's the, the, the thought behind it. Um, I, my initial view on this is that we've had a war on drugs for 50 years, and for 50 years it has failed. We need to be moving from a punitive model to a treatment model. 
do, treatment and decriminalization decriminal, obviously takes that into consideration, but let's talk about the treatment. It's not just you know drug addiction treatment, it's mental health counseling, it's job counseling, and all of those wraparound services need to be in place, in my view, for a treatment and decriminalization model to succeed. So that's my answer to the first question. The second question is about safe injection sites or harm reduction sites. Um, I believe that there's not one person in Vermont who hasn't been untouched by the opioid crisis. Um, all of us know someone, are someone, have a neighbor, a loved one who has suffered from opioid use disorder. <clears throat> I personally have you know, gone around the state in my campaign and I've met with mothers and fathers and others who have lost children and loved ones to the opioid crisis. To do nothing is unacceptable. As for specifically um, the harm, the concept of a harm reduction site, um, if there were um, agreement from the federal prosecutors that they weren't going to prosecute, and there was was a <clears throat> excuse me a, a local community partner who was willing to host, and there were those wraparound services, I and a community wanted to, to do that, I would absolutely support that. Could you just repeat it one more time? Sure. For the first part. Yeah. Um, if the legislature considered decriminalization of drug position, what, drug, drug possession, what would be your position? And then, what's your view on safe injection sites? Um, I am. My view is I would lobby hard against decriminalization. Like I brought up earlier. Um, we have an opioid crisis. We're going to be getting 100 plus million dollars over 10 years from Big Pharma because of the opioid crisis. Uh, by decriminalizing it, I just think we're going to be making the problem worse. Uh, I, 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 def I don't think that's a good idea. I just don't, and I, I, I would lobby hard against it. Um, as far as safe injection sites, um, I agree in part with something that Charity said. I think that people need, if they have an addiction, they need counseling. They need to f not feel stigmatized, but they also need someone who is going to help them get away from their addiction. And, excuse me, if we are just going to have sites where someone can just go and get a clean needle to get a fix, I, I am, I'm against it. Uh, I do definitely support uh, sites that would provide counseling and it would be a, an agreement upon the person who was going to this, the safe injection site for needles or to get their whatever their drug of choice was, but they would need to enter into, into an agreement where they were going to try to get start on treatment. The drug addiction problem doesn't end until we give treatment, therapy, and training. If we don't break the cycle of addiction and get people away from their addiction, all we're going to do is have more and more safe injection sites and nobody will be moving from their addiction. Thank you. Our next question is um, about, about a very specific situation, which you may or may not know much about, we'll see. What can the Attorney General do about the economic, social, and health injustices of locating the F-35s near lower income communities like Winooski that have voted against their basing through democratic means? Mr. Tagovia. Uh, the F-35, I believe, is a fighter aircraft that you might be talking about. Um, my first question is, is the facility where the F-35s are going to be housed, is it something that's been there for a very long time? Um, if it's been there for a very long time, uh, I wonder if it's just a problem that for some reason, the military might be the target and not the F-35 or noise. Um, it's, we've seen this play before where 
people move in next to an airport and next thing you know they're complaining about the airport i don't know all of the specifics of the situation you're talking about but um in in the interest of national security seeing as the f-35 i believe is an integral part of our armed forces i think it would be a good idea to, to take a good look at it before we decide that we don't want the f-35s thank you um, <clears throat> that is not an area that the Attorney General has authority over. It's not something that the Attorney General would um, be a part of deciding or controlling. All right, thank you. All right, this next question. Both state and federal laws have been passed requiring equity in insurance coverage of mental health care, but we do not have equity. What thoughts do you have regarding what the Attorney General's office can do about this, and what would you do if heading the office? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about just mental health care generally, because I don't think that we have like a, a great role um, on that specific issue. Um, but I mentioned when I was mentioning the seven divisions of the office, I mentioned human services. Within the human services division of the office, we have many um, lawyers who service the uh, different departments within the agency of human services, mental health being one, um, you know, Department of Children and Families, Corrections, and so on. And that is an area where we get to provide the legal services. We don't have a lot of you know, independent discretion, but we are the ones who have the expertise to support the department. We do a lot of that uh, at the Attorney General's office, and it's, it's great work, it's important work, and the lawyers are sort of sprinkled across state government. The other area that I'll highlight I just think is so important is the Community Justice Division. Within the Community Justice Division, there's really two branches. One liaises with organizations and the legislature on some of these topics we've been talking about tonight. And the other oversees our pretrial services and court diversion program, which is a very successful program we've had for 30 something years, I think, that helps folks with lower level crimes get diverted to the treatment and the counseling and the support that they need much lower recidivism rate and um, it's really successful we're really proud of that program and we can learn a lot from it and from some of the restorative um, mo justice models that they um, that they have there. mental health treatment being a common theme that we talk about when we talk about public safety so that's why i i flag it in response to that question okay thank you mr Zacharia. Mental health, the mental health community in, in this country, not just the state, I believe for the past 50 years or more, I don't think has been um, serving us very well. I think one of the better ways that we could possibly improve is to, with, like Charity said, the, the division in the Attorney General's office, make it more available to people so that they understand what their, uh, their ability to get treatment is so that we don't have uh, the problems. The other thing also would be to have in the criminal justice system a way to make an evaluation so that someone with a mental health issue uh, doesn't get caught up in one side of our criminal justice system when they should be getting help for a mental illness that might keep them indefinitely out of the criminal justice system. Thank you. All right, this next one is also another kind of specific question. Would you support a lawsuit against Monsanto Bayer demanding compensation for damages incurred from the use of their product, PCB? This would be specifically for the cost of testing and remediation of schools in Vermont and potentially health costs for those harmed by PCBs. Chester Taglia. I think if we could show, if it could be shown that there was direct evidence it would be supported, but I think it would be very difficult to see that there was direct evidence. So I hesitate to um, say whether I would or not without more, uh, without more information and more direct, 
direct knowledge of, of a certain situation. Okay. Um, you know, I've mentioned many, many times tonight my feelings about, um, you know, uh, safety and environmentalism. Um, I, of course, if it was justified, would feel comfortable um, bringing a lawsuit against the manufacturers of PCBs. And, um, you know, we have a situation in, uh, right now that a lot of schools are being tested. And um, as Attorney General, we'll monitor closely the testing of those schools and other uh, public buildings and um, would not hesitate to take action if justified. All right, thank you. This person asks, will you commit to releasing records related to the EB-5 scandal? <laughs> and what are your views on the issues around this one way or the other? Um, as Chief of Staff, I oversaw the work that we did in the Attorney General's Office of uh, Public Records Act requests. Um, and with regards to the EB-5 lawsuit records, um, it's important to just remind you that the Attorney General is the attorney to the state, and when the state is sued, the Attorney General defends the state, and that is the dynamic occurring in the EB-5 lawsuit. When, we all know this, even if we're not lawyers from the movies, but um, when there is an attorney-client relationship, uh, there are documents and communications that are, are, quote, privileged. And because they are privileged, they are exempt from the Public Records Act. And, um, and those records have not been uh, released because the client does not wish to release them. The, the, the attorney-client privilege belongs to the client. With regards to the EB-5 records specifically, there is a plan in place to release those records once the lawsuit is over. As Attorney General, I will stick to that plan. I think it's a good one and um, look forward to one day that lawsuit being over and releasing those records. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tagovia. Um, I think transparency is one of the things that we must have if we're going to have the people we serve, the Vermonters we serve, trust us as people who are employed as uh, they're parts of their government. Uh, I con I'm concerned that the uh, EB-5 scandal, if the records are held until it's quote unquote over, um, will the taxpayers of Vermont have any recourse? We need to know if, if there is, if there was public corruption, I think this, the Vermonters need to know, and uh, the sooner they know, the better. I understand uh, lawyer-client uh, privilege, but again, the people in Vermont need to un know that they can trust their public officials to do the right thing for them and with their money. Without transparency, we can't have that. Uh, and that, that's why I, I think it's very important that the information get out as soon as possible and not wait until it's over and there's no recourse for uh, Vermonters. All right, thank you. All right, this one's a little long. Act 41 from 2019 mandates that the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, in conjunction with the AG's office, reviews the fair and impartial policing policies of law enforcement agencies to ensure that they comply with the state's model policy. Recently, the auditor's report on the council found that out of 12 law enforcement agencies reviewed, four had policies that differed from the fair and impartial policing model policy. Also, several policies that were reviewed and found to be compliant were then changed afterward. Would you consider an independent community board, perhaps in conjunction with the Attorney General's office, to review these policies instead? Mr. Taglia. Um, I would want to look at the policy specifically and at some of the departments that had policies that were not within the, not within the guidelines. Um, I don't know that adding uh, a civilian board would be the right way to do it. Uh, having maybe a board of 
maybe police chiefs or something like that so that everybody, all this, the departments could better have uh, the standards. I, I don't know that I would want a civilian uh, council le uh, or something like that, but it would depend also on um, the, the role that they would play. I, as I've said before, um, people in the community need to know and feel that their law enforcement works for them and with them. If we know who our police officers and our sheriffs are, and we interact with them, then we're gonna have a better relationship with them. Right now, uh, the relationship is soured very badly. And the best way we get over that is for our law enforcement to reach out to us and for them, uh, us to reach out to them. Uh, I think that's the way we get the best policing our, our tax dollars can get for us. All right, thank you. The fair and impartial policing policies, when they were when they were put in place, they were reviewed by someone at the Attorney General's office, and they the local policies needed to be as restrictive, um, at least as restrictive as the the statewide policy. So I don't know if the four are different because they're more restrictive or, or not, but I wanted to I wanted to flag that. Um, I would be fine, you know, totally open to the idea of a more collaborative review rather than just having someone in the Attorney General's office review them. But I would also be you know, fine to have us do a re-review of them as well. Okay, thank you. All right, <laughs> Vermont has some good protections for employees against sexual harassment and other workplace discrimination, but there are still far too many people who are experiencing these barriers at work. What steps will you take to strengthen these protection, protections and reduce the number of people who are experiencing this? <clears throat> the Attorney General Civil Rights Unit is the unit who um, handles those cases, and um, one of the uh, changes that I proposed was to have a more ro robust reporting by that unit so that we can get a little bit more data um, and information about uh, what the patterns are, and therefore we can analyze and decide how we can address them better. Right now, that unit does um, get out into the community to provide education and is a resource for the legislature regularly. Uh, I will encourage that, and to the extent that the celebrity of the Attorney General is helpful, we'll accompany them as they do their work. It's really important work, and um, the unit is, is, uh, is, is doing a good job. They're, they're pretty small, and I'll always make sure that they have enough resources to do the work that they do. Um, but I do think that data collection is really important because it can just inform changes to do better. Thank you. Mr. Tavivia. I think um, one of the best ways is to educate the public that the Attorney General's office actually has a unit that can handle these kinds of things and make it more accessible um, if it's not very, um, so that, they, that anyone who has experienced sexual harassment feels like they have a place to go. Um, I think Charity and I are in agreement on this. Um, but I think part of it is, you know, I, I, if I've never been a victim of sexual harassment, so I, I, I don't know. But if someone is a victim, sometimes they don't, they feel isolated. So if they, if, if somehow, in the workplace where some of the other postings are about uh, employees' rights, that should be made more prominent so that people actually, employees actually know that they have an advocate in the uh, Attorney General's office if they find that they need that. Thank you. All right, this question is about something that's gonna be on the ballot in November. Proposal two for amending the Vermont Constitution would prohibit any form of slavery or indentured servitude. Please describe forms of slavery or indentured servitude that still exist uh, in Vermont or the US that you are aware of. If this proposal passes, how will it impact the Attorney General's office and what leadership would you provide to enforce it? Mr. Um, I. 
don't know that I know of any type of slavery or indentured servitude. Um, and I don't know, the, the, the only thing that comes to mind when I read that is, uh, could indentured servitude or could, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, drawing a blank. <clears throat> could indentured servitude be uh, like what is, uh, Described like in attorneys, when they are students, they go to work for law firms, but they don't get paid. Is that something that could be described as indentured servitude? Um, it, it seemed like it's a, uh, a kind of a time-honored tradition where you go and you work for no pay, but you get all of the experience, for instance, at a high-powered law firm, but when you leave school, that's one of the first places you could wind up with a job. Um, I, that's the only thing I could think of that could possibly be called indentured servitude. Um, and could you repeat for me the other part of the question? Uh, just what impact would it have on the Attorney General's office if it passes, and would you do anything to enforce it? Um, I, again, that would have to depend on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, thank you. Ms. Clark? Um, I will be voting yes on this. It's something, you know, we, we grew up in Vermont being told that, you know, we were the first state to ban slavery. That's part of our lore. And to realize mm, it's, not, it's not that simple. Um, it's disturbing. Um, I'm glad that we're, we're clearing it up. And I think it's easy to think, well, this is just pointless. This isn't really happening. Um, but the truth is, there are parts in, the, in this country, there are places in this country where incarcerated individuals are not being treated um, in a way that I, I think is fair, and um, in many, many, many ways. And this is one of them where they're not being compensated for work that they're doing, and it is upsetting. I think it's good here for us to be codifying in our constitution the the values that we have, um, and and then living by them. So I'm, I'm pleased to be voting yes this November on this one. Thank you. My next question, how will you lead the state in developing appropriate systems to track and publish data on prosecutor conduct? That is charging decisions, diversion recommendations, bail recommendations, plea, office, plea offers and sentencing recommendations by race, ethnicity, gender, age, and indigency to, to identify racial, gender, and class disparities in prosecution. Well, as I mentioned um, earlier, I had um, met with internally once we got the report that recommended that we do a better job of tracking data like that, and I had met with that division and suggested we start you know, tracking that data. We, it wouldn't be a burden, and, and I think that they probably have already started doing that. Um, one thing that we always want to uh, be, be mindful of, um, not so much in this case, but I just want to say, because I was thinking about it with the civil rights case, is sometimes people have a right to privacy and don't, you know, we have a very small state, and sometimes to say, oh, you know, one person of this particular race, something, you know, something happened, um, it really feels like you're violating their privacy because everyone in that community might know who that who you're talking about. So I want to acknowledge that, and that would obviously be avoided. But the truth is, I, I'm a big believer that when you collect data, you're going to have more information to adjust policy and laws to reflect what's actually happening. And if we want to um, do better when it comes to uh, racial disparities, we really want to make sure that we have that data. It's helpful. Thank you. Mr. Taglivia. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to track to be sure that we're not missing anything in the law that needs to be addressed to be corrected to make sure that we are not adversely affecting someone because of their race. But I think also tracking that kind of data also can be helpful in actually preventing us interacting 
with individuals in the future. If we actually know through our data collection what we're looking at so that we can actually make a difference and be better serving Vermonters. And I think the best thing we could do to, to serve people in our communities is to be blind to a lot of the data that we're collecting. Like I said before, Lady Justice is blind, and it's the good thing. Thank you. All right, how will you use the Office of Attorney General to address poverty and wealth-based disparities in our criminal legal system? Mr. Taglia. I'd have to see what exactly um, the question is, is trying to address. Um, I, I don't know that the Attorney General's office is, is, is seeing uh, wealth-based disparities. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, is, is trying to address. Can, can you reread the question? Sure. How will you use the Office of Attorney General to address poverty and wealth-based disparities in our criminal legal system? Within the Attorney General's office um, is the Community Justice Division, which I mentioned earlier. And um, one of the branches of that division does a lot of liaising, including with the legislature. Um, they advocate for reforms that we feel are necessary and they work to help educate when necessary. We have a wonderful citizen legislature and sometimes it's helpful to have a lawyer in the room who can provide that information. So uh, right now, the office is probably formulating their plan for January when the legislature starts. I'm really looking forward to being a part of that work to identify what areas um, we will be focusing on specifically when it comes to necessary reforms to the criminal justice system and being mindful of the disparities um, that we uh, know about, and one of those being income-based. Um, one of the issues that has come up a lot is bail reform. I, I believe bail reform is necessary. It relies on income rather than risk, and I think it's a better way to um, rely on a risk-based system. All right, thank you. So this next question is about elections, and um, let's see what the Attorney General, how, what the connection to the Attorney General's office is. Accessible and secure elections are critical for our democracy. Please outline concerns you have about elections in Vermont and what you might do as Attorney General. Clark. I, we are so fortunate um, in Vermont to have a very accessible, open election system. To be able to go on election day and vote is wonderful. To have the clerks be able to communicate so well to each other, to, to work out people who are moving is wonderful. It works very, very well as someone who, um, I did vote when I was in New York City, in, in New York City, and I was one, I, it was very chaotic and complicated and how refreshing to come home, and it just works very smoothly. Um, one of the issues that uh, is important to me is that we maintain this system. It's not a system that the Attorney General's office runs. It's something the Secretary of State's office runs. But the Attorney General is called upon when um, there is something uh, you know, fishy going on. And there was an example of that in, in recent history. And, um, and it was uh, concluded that the person was trying to test the system to see if it worked. And it, it worked because he was caught. Um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> here we are. Um, in, t in 2022, and we'll, um, we'll be voting again in November, I serve as a justice of the peace um, in my town, although I couldn't do much because I'm now I'm running for office, so I'm not allowed to, but in, in the past, it's been really just wonderful. I'm, I'm a big believer in our, our system here in Vermont. Um, the Secretary of State, like Charity said, is responsible for the elections. Um, I've, in my experience attending meetings, I've found that um, 
the BCAs, the, the local towns, have done a good job of maintaining the elections, although I know that there are some uh, boards of civil authority that have expressed concern because they need a little bit more help to maintain voter rolls and stuff like that. But I have found that in Vermont, um, people are very happy that their elections have been without any uh, any major uh, fraud or anything like that. The attorney general would get, only get involved, like Charity said, unless the uh, secretary of state found something that needed to be addressed. But like I said, I've found that in my asking around, people are very uh, happy with what they have found as far as the elections. All right, thank you. This is another question about prosecutors. What role can the Attorney General play in setting standards and consistency among prosecutors? Mr. Tagovia. Uh, as the Chief in Law Enforcement Officer, the Attorney General can play a very big role. Um, like I said, I would steer the Attorney General's office um, toward dealing a lot more with uh, criminal, the criminal division, but we could set the standard for <clears throat> how we would deal with um, not only criminal justice issues, but all uh, throughout the other divisions. Uh, we would be able to set a standard for professionalism, uh, efficiency, and um, resolving cases in a timely manner. Um, I recently spoke with a couple who had an issue where they found themselves very frustrated because of the length of time an investigation wound up taking. Um, and it's basically one of those, those things, the old saying is, is true, justice delayed is justice denied. So where we can, we need to be sure, without rushing and uh, making mistakes, see to it that the people who um, find a need to have the Attorney General's office involved have their issue resolved as, as quickly and as timely in a manner as we can possibly make that happen. Thank you. Clark. I have a great deal of respect for the, the state's attorneys, the county prosecutors, um, who have concurrent, we have concurrent jurisdiction at the Attorney General's office with those county prosecutors. Um, and we work, we try to work very well with them and would continue that. The uh, prosecutors on the county level are part of a state, you know, organization on um, this, the attorney general, the uh, state's attorneys and sheriff's organization. And we try to work closely with them as well. We, the attorney general does not, however, oversee the county prosecutors. They're independently elected, four-year terms, and we work alongside them. As a you know, as a colleague, and uh, to the extent that we can be helpful, because our office is a little, it's bigger than most of the, uh, I think almost all, I think of the of the state's attorney's offices. Um, the criminal division has maybe ten or fifteen people in it in, in our office, and um, we always try to help each other out um, and have that colleagueship, and um, collaborate in, in the legislature as well on issues. And I would want to certainly continue that collaboration and that colleagueship as Attorney General. Thank you. All right, we have one more question and then we'll go to closing statements. And this is one that you've touched a little bit on before. Um, it's a sort of a broad question, but perhaps you can go into some specifics. How will you hold corporations that pollute our air, soil, and water accountable? Ms. Clark. Our environmental division is, it's, Excellent. Um, they are very devoted, and and they just have a lot of um, uh, smart, hardworking, and incredibly competent um, attorneys working there. They work really well and closely with the Agency of Natural Resources, and um, I'm really proud of that division. They're they're just wonderful, and they do great work. They also testify in the legislature um, really well. Just so much knowledge there. Because this is, you know, a personal value that I have, it's really important to me. Um, environmental issues are another marquee issue for me. I will absolutely um, uh, be 
making sure uh, to the full extent that I can that we are protecting Vermont's natural resources, beautiful lakes, rivers, forests. Um, it's really important and it's an important role that, that the Attorney General has. In terms of specifics, I um, will also note that um, there is a, a good way to use the Consumer Protection Act to protect um, in the environment. And we have done that uh, in a greenwashing case that we brought against the fossil fuel company. And I won't hesitate to think creatively about using all the laws at our disposal to hold polluters to account and to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect Vermont. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. In cases where it's been found or there is evidence uh, that there are polluters, there is a pollution issue, um, I would by all means go to the, ends, to the ends of the earth to prosecute uh, any corporation that winds up uh, trying to get away with pollution, uh, polluting whether it be the water, the air, or the soil. Um, I just would be cautious to be sure that we were not being heavy-handed in the sense that uh, we were trying to be uh, signaling that we don't like a certain industry. Um, if, if there is actual negligence or um, intent, then by all means, I would, I would not hesitate, but I, I would not be uh, an advocate to, to take action against um, an industry, no matter what it was, to try to um, close an industry down because I um, had a personal animus or, or something like that against it, or you know, make the attorney general's office do such a thing. But you know, pollution, it, it, we have laws that need to be uh, applied to everyone. Everyone is equal in the eyes of the law and co corporations are going to be held accountable just like individuals would be if they're, they run afoul of the law. Thank you. We, we have one more audience question, but I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Sorry. You covered such a range here. Your questions have been amazing. Thank you all. Um, so it's time for closing statements. And Mr. Taglavia, you have two minutes for a closing statement. Um, like I said earlier, um, I'm not an attorney. Um, I know that I would be able to lead a team in the Attorney General's office that would make Vermonters feel proud and feel happy and content that they had an advocate in the Attorney General's office that was going to do what was in the best interest of Vermont. Um, I am a relatively new resident to this state, but I have been in a quest to find rural life and a rural lifestyle that I have found that I really enjoy in Vermont. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do this was because I believe I can be of service and be of a great service to the Vermonters, all Vermonters, no, whether, no matter your economic status. Um, I live on a gravel road on 115 acres in a log cabin. There are probably six camps on my road. And I enjoy this type of lifestyle. And I am going to do everything I can in my power within the law to help preserve the beautiful Vermont lifestyle. Thank you. Mr. Clark. This state and this country is at a pivotal moment in history. Um, we have you know, gun violence virtually unchecked by Congress for decades. We have climate change presenting the existential crisis of our time. Our reproductive rights are being stripped from us and the list goes on and on. What we need right now at this moment in time is an attorney general with the experience to understand how to use the office to get the best results for Vermont, who understands 
the role of attorney general in serving the legislature, in serving client agencies, and in helping Vermonters. Something that didn't come up that much tonight is the consumer assistance program, which I oversaw. And I usually am always talking about the consumer assistance program because I believe so strongly in their work. And I usually like to drop the 1-800 number, so I'm just going to 1-800-649-2424. If you have a consumer problem, please call them. Um, but we do so much important work at the Attorney General's office, and we need a leader who knows what the office does. I hope that tonight I have shown you all of the information, all of the knowledge and experience that I have that I can bring to bear on the office to be the next leader and to be the first woman elected Attorney General in Vermont. Thank you both so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to Sonia to close us out. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank you all for coming, thank the candidates for their lively response to a wide range of questions, <laughs> to Kingdom Access Television, who is showing, recording this program and streaming it live, to the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum, and our other co-sponsors, the Vermont Commission on Women, the ACLU, and the Vermont Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. <clears throat> and being the League of Women Voters, I want to remind you all that you, if you are an active voter, you should be receiving your general election ballot in the next few days. You can <coughs> vote it, you can mail it back to your town clerk, you can drop it off at your town clerk's office, or you can take it to the polling place with you on election day. Make an effort, make a decision, make a difference. Every vote counts, and we know that to be the case in Vermont. So have a good night.